first of all, I'd like to thank everybody coming. It's a beautiful day outside. I know it's hard to be inside on like such a glorious weather. But I think a testament to the sunshine that we're trying to enlighten all of us on what we can do to not only learn about our cardiovascular health, but what we can do to improve our cardiac health. Now, I, I have some slides that I put together, but as you'll see, probably within slide number two and three, I go off topic. So that's okay. What I'd like to do is speak for about a half hour, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. The only rule is no personal questions. You know, my doctor did this, or my husband had this. I'll, do, I'll be happy to answer general questions, and any personal questions, I'd like to refer you to your primary care physician, as we have wonderful physicians and ancillary people on staff that can help you learn and help guide you through all your, your health questions and your health needs. And on that note, I want to emphasize my first point. Whenever uh, you give lectures and you give talks, there's a basic tenet of, of lecturing, which is say what you're going to say, say it, and repeat it. And there's three points that I like to make at the beginning, during our discussion, and as we conclude at the end. The first is that the fact that you're here shows that you are interested and committed to learning and hopefully in implementing factors related to improve your health. And that's just a testament to your own curiosity, and I believe a testament to our institution in helping guide you and working with you in all aspects of your health. Today we're gonna to talk about cardiac wellness, but a, a, a mission for the institution and the, the mission for our hospital is wellness. And we look at that on a broad-based measures. We look at wellness from cardiovascular wellness, from women's health wellness, and, and to specifically do testing and evaluation for all of your needs. And it's a teamwork approach that we like to invest in all of you. You know, we are happy to be the coach and the general manager of your health team, but when push comes to shove, you're the player. A coach can only do so much. A coach has the responsibility for doing research, for discussing the concept with his team players, and for being the main cheerleader. But when push comes to shove, the players have to do the work. And we're here to help you do that. And, and that's what I'd like to discuss, is how we can work with you on education and promoting your own personal health. And I just love the fact that everybody's wearing red. And I said it's pretty much a toll, and I do not see one person that doesn't have some red on them. And that's a testament to this time. And we specifically pick this time of the year to do our discussion because February is Heart Health Month, and in particular, it's called Red for Women. Okay, Red Health Month for Women. And that's what we're honoring today. We're honoring you. We're honoring you as Stalwarts members, members of our community, and most importantly, as the primary uh, caregivers and initiators of health care in your family. Because we all know the women are in charge. There's no question about that. Women are responsible for not only the knowledge, but also making sure to take the responsibility as the mother and as the patriarch of your family to ensure the health of your, your loved ones. Now there's a little problem with that because women are great at helping others, but sometimes we don't look at ourselves and say, what do we need to do for ourselves? And that's a major point that I'm gonna make is that women, <coughs> wives, mothers, children are wonderful about helping their loved ones get their health care, but sometimes they neglect it for themselves. And my job is to impress upon you the importance of taking ownership of your own health care. And I would like to empower you with some information that you can learn, read, ingest, and to discuss with your family and your health care providers. Now just for some housekeeping notes, we have five handouts. There will not be a test. We were going to have a test, but we decided not to do a test. So there's five pieces of paper um, I'd like you to take home with you. These are, I'm sorry, I do have to get my glasses on. Here we go. I just want to make sure everyone has these, and if we run out of copies, I will make sure before you leave we have copies. Okay, now there's no particular order. I'm just going to review this. The first is called, uh, it's a handout from Circulations, 
and a lot of typing on the front and the back. And that's the current guidelines for health care for women, for cardiovascular health care for women, which was just published several months ago. And I'm going to highlight some of these points. But I would strongly recommend that you keep this with your folder of your health care information and bring it with you when you go to your providers, your primary care provider, your women's health provider, or your cardiologist, if you're seeing a cardiologist, and make sure these points are covered. The second point that I wanted to make is I'm going to be discussing a lot of information on diet and exercise. So I have a little handout here on portion size, and I'll discuss this in excruciating detail. <laughs> And I have something called the DASH diet, which is suggestions on specific dietary uh, interventions that will help improve individuals with high blood pressure. And I have another handout that I made that we give all of our patients, and it's got a lot of lines. It's a spreadsheet. It's a journal or a log. And I recommend that you make some copies of these for yourself. And it's a very important educational process. But I'd like everyone one day in the next couple weeks to honestly fill this out. To go from the minute you wake up through the day. I want you to write down all the uh, foods you ingest at the different times of day and portion size. And also on the bottom list your activity for that day. And then bring it in when you go to your health care provider and he or she will help you do an assessment and to see what your strengths are and what we can do to help improve some of the aspects on the factors that you're already um, already doing to improve your cardiovascular health. Two other very important points is we have a booklet called Know Your Numbers, which is point number two. Point number one is you're here and you're empowered and you are taking control of your health. Point number two is you have to know your numbers, which means you have to have health information and testing. I know people don't like tests done, but this is critical. Okay, we can't just look at you and say your blood pressure is normal. You can't be like my 83-year-old mother says, well, I feel good today. I think I'll take my blood pressure medicine. That doesn't fly, especially, you know, in my world. So she understands and she has one of these books. I just mailed it to her. God love her. She lives in Connecticut. And she has a wonderful doctor. And she takes this book in, and she teaches her doctor about filling out her pages um, for knowing her number. And this has information not only on cardiovascular health. It has information um, for your routine exams to keep dates and logs. Wonderful information to uh, measure your, your weight on a serial basis, your blood pressures. Uh, cholesterol and lipid measurements that your physicians will be doing. Other uh, medical conditions, if you have a thyroid condition, they'll check your thyroid test. Hearing and vision tests, which are very important for your overall health care. Dental health, eye health, screening that we recommend, for example, colonoscopies, etc. So please take this and keep this in a very safe place. I bring this with you every time you go to your physician or your health care provider because you'll be filling in data when you go to see them. And then the most important point is a pen. Okay? To take notes, there will not be a test, but we have a wonderful <coughs> pen that says St. Genevieve County Memorial Hospital. I don't know why it's not red. Next year we're going to have red pen. That's okay. Blue is a good color. You like men like blue. So St. Mary's County Memorial Hospital, and it has our website on there, which you'll see on all of our, of all of our promotional material, www.stgenevievehospital.org. And you'll get wonderful information, not only about providers, but services we do, programs, lectures, community action projects, and other ways that will not only help you in health education, but we ask you to help volunteer to work with us on certain projects. We're instituting a large research program. For example, we're starting a large hypertension program in the next several months. You'll read about it in the Herald when it comes to you uh, every Wednesday afternoon in your mail that I've learned since I just paid my yearly fee. And um, you'll see advertisements on studies 
and we would like you to call for information um, if you think that it's something you would be interested in and to work with us. So please remember our website, www.stgenevievehospital.org. Okay, so that's the housekeeping notes. Can we turn the lights down a little bit? Perfect, I have great helpers here. Okay, so what we're gonna discuss today is the benefit of risk factor modification. First of all, we have to find out what risk factors are. And what we are going to do is say what we can learn that will help us predict what will potentially come and how we can intervene. Because there's three aspects to overall medical care. You have to do an assessment or an evaluation. You have to come up with a plan and you have to do it. Okay, you can't as I mentioned, I can't just look at you and mention this is your blood pressure. I have to measure your blood pressure. And it has to be more than one time a year. So especially for people over the age of 50, and I believe one or two people here are over the age of 50, just like myself, you know, you need to see a physician more than once a year. A yearly physical is not acceptable. You should see your physician or your uh, nurse practitioner, whoever's your healthcare provider, you know, in our system or, or wherever you go, hopefully, you know, you'll, you'll be coming here because we have wonderful opportunities for you that I'll discuss. And please make regular visits, a yearly physical with a full evaluation with your laboratory studies, full questionnaires, and then regular visits to follow up, follow up on specific issues that come up during the year. And we have uh, and one other point that I'd like to make, and we can discuss this with you when you come in for your visit, on our website, we have an area called the patient portal. And you are able to access your own information and information that might be related to conditions that you have. And the staff in our office is well versed on discussing that with you and to helping you and they'll work with you. They'll go on the computer and work with you on your password and such to learn my portal. We can communicate with you. We can send you emails on your lab results. You can see your lab results. You can send us questions and information, and we check it several times a day um, in the office. So that's a second way for you to communicate with us, because it has to be a bilateral communication. That's the only way we can help educate each other. You have to educate us on your questions, and our job is to coach and educate you on what we suggest we can do to help you through the questions and concerns you have. Excuse me. I'm going to start with my first uh, concept, which is water. Now, you'll notice we have a lot of water around here. I'm going to be talking about water a lot because hydration is important. Okay, so the first question I have for the, for the group is, how many people drink over six to eight glasses of water a day? A glass is defined as eight ounces. Okay, you do? Okay, good. Therefore, right off the bat, you get the first prize, which is a bottle of water. Now, I'm not going to give you the big one because it may be heavy. Okay, all right, now, number two. Okay, how many people uh, discuss their volume intake and how much water they drink with their professional? That your doctors and nurses know how much water you drink. You see, there aren't that many hands. So water consumption, fluid and electrolyte balance is very important. Okay, so no bottles of water go out for that one. So that's one point you can make in your law, which is to measure your water intake and to discuss that, to make sure that that's appropriate with your health care provider, with home health services, that we have a wonderful array of home health services to help you and, and your loved ones. If your family members, for example, are more homebound, we have ancillary services that can help you. So one point I'd like you to think about is your um, uh, volume intake and, and keeping strong. Now let's see if I can get this to work. Point it to the... This did work before. You're going to do it? I don't know. Is that slide? That's number two. Okay. Okay. What is this? This is Haleakala Volcano, Maui, Hawaii, 2.30. Uh, actually, it's about... 3.30, 4.30 in the morning. There's two points of this slide. One is that 
um, hopefully going to be, as I discussed with you, you're going to be illuminated on the concepts of cardiovascular health. But there's a real practical point of this. I was in Hawaii, the one time I was in Hawaii, uh, we were there for a family, a family event, and my son, God love him, who's uh, you know, in the Air Force Academy now, is about six or seven years old, very difficult to get him to wake up in the morning. So I finally, literally, carried him out of bed onto the little shuttle bus to get to the uh, volcano so we can get up to the top, see sunrise, and then ride our bicycles down the volcano, which was absolutely spectacular. And I'll show you some pictures as we go through. So I use this as my theme, because as the sun comes up, we're gonna be illuminated on different concepts of your healthcare, and hopefully the whole picture will emerge by the end of our discussion. So what is the benefit of screening? Why do we do this? Well, the reason we do screening is to evaluate and to figure out what risk factors you have as an individual, because most risk factors are modifiable. We're going to talk about hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, smoking as examples. And we have to do an evaluation to find out if you do uh, have those risk factors and what we can do to intervene to make those stronger. So we want the earlier we, we do our intervention, our treatment, the better. Just like we do breast uh, mammograms and screening. Okay, you don't want to wait until you have a problem. You want to be proactive. You want to catch things before they happen. So that's what screening programs are. We want to detect disease before it becomes advanced. Next slide. Okay, so for every heart, there's a story. Every patient is different. Every patient is an individual. And that's why building a relationship, a long-standing relationship with your healthcare providers, with your healthcare system is critical. By going from one doctor to another system to another system, we don't want things to fall through the cracks. So it's very important for you to stay within a, a controlled, environment of providers, and uh, we have a, a very strong responsibility too. We have a responsibility to communicate. We have a responsibility to communicate with, uh, amongst ourselves, and most importantly, a responsibility to communicate with you. We have implemented a very extensive, what we call a, a electronic medical health record and computer system within our medical system here, as all of our physicians and healthcare providers or employees of the hospital were on the same com computer system. So if you see Dr. X and Dr. X wants you to see me, I can pull up the note that Dr. X or nurse practitioner X did in the office earlier that day or five years ago. And I can see what's been done. And that's most important because sometimes you might not remember, but most importantly, it's for what we call continuity of care. So you want to stay in a system where all the information is available. So we're going to learn about what is heart disease, why is it important, what is a heart attack and a stroke, are you at risk, and what can I do about it. Then I have another side little section that we're going to discuss at the end. So um, this is just a, a, a sample of pictures that we show to show that this is an example of a normal heart, and I have some samples here to show. We can come up and look later. A heart in a normal person is about the size of your fist. So, in our young women here who are my wonderful helpers, their heart will be about this size, okay? Because that's approximately the size of their fist. As we get older, as our body gets larger, with age and with weight and height and maturity, the heart becomes a little bit bigger. So this would probably be the size of the heart in my body. As we can see, it's different from our young women helpers. It's a little bit bigger. What commonly happens as heart disease develops, and heart disease sometimes results in weakening of the heart, what we call heart failure, the heart gets weak and it starts to enlarge. Okay? And then the heart might be this size. 
And I'm going to discuss this and we can pass this around. So we go from our friendly youngsters and teenagers to our healthy middle-aged individuals to our individuals with heart failure and a weak heart. And as you can see, this heart is two or three times the size of a normal heart. And this heart can't function normally. So we have to give you medicine, we have intensive lifestyle measures, extensive utility of home care services and ancillary services such as the dietitians, exercise physiologists, the wonderful cardiac rehab program we have here, all to help your heart become strong and, and try to retain normalcy. <clears throat> we'll get to some of these other issues in more detail as the discussions go on. Okay, so we're gonna talk about uh, coronary heart disease, which is blockages of the blood vessels of the heart. This would be an example of a blood vessel. It's a, this would be pretty much the size of a blood vessel, for example, in a cow model. But um, the blood vessels in the body are all connected. The blood vessels in your brain, in your neck, in your heart, in your belly, and in your arms and legs are all the same blood vessels. That's why, for example, if some of you, let's say, are recommended to have surgery on the blood vessels of your neck for a blockage, what does your doctor do? He refers you to me to have a stress test because if you have blockages in the blood vessels of your neck, there's a 50% chance you have blockages in the blood vessels of your heart. So they want to make sure with going to surgery that your heart is strong so you can tolerate the surgery for your neck surgery or if you have a blockage in the blood vessel of your leg. So blood vessels will go from a nice even space where the blood goes to gradually developing fat deposits, which is shown by the yellow fatty streaks, and it gets bigger over time. And then what happens is that if the fat deposit called the plaque ruptures, a blood clot develops and it blocks off the artery. And that could be in the heart, and that's called a heart attack. That could be in the brain, and that's called an occlusive or embolic stroke. That could be in the legs, and that's called peripheral artery disease, peripheral vascular disease. So we have a progression from a fully open lumen, which is where the blood goes, to some moderate blockage, to a severe blockage caused by a blood clot. And we can pass this around and you can take a look at that and see, get some first-hand experience what I'm discussing. Some of these I'm gonna push through to get to the, the more salient features here. Now what are some basic facts which I think are important from an educational perspective for all of us? Cardiovascular disease is responsible for about 500,000 deaths in women a year, which is just about one death every 60 to 90 minutes a year, okay, in women, okay? And more women die from heart disease than die from cancer or other diseases combined. So it's important to, to continue to get your women's health care, but also your general medical care and to have your heart your cardiovascular system evaluated, okay? Uh, one in uh, two and a half or three women die from a cardiovascular cause, be that a heart attack or a stroke or the main ones, okay? And this is a very important point. Two thirds of women who die from a cardiovascular problem, their first inclination to have a problem is the sudden death. And this is much higher than men. In men, it's 50%. So in women, women, when they die of a heart problem, it usually is their first manifestation. And there's a lot of reasons for that. It goes back to what I alluded to earlier. Women are great at giving advice to their husband and their mother and their children to see the doctor, but they don't go themselves. They say, oh, this, this pain I've been having, I'm a little short of breath, don't worry about it, I'm tired. You know, I'm taking care of my mother in the nursing home. Or, you know, I get a little bit sweaty and short of breath when I go for a walk, but oh, it's just the weather's bad and I'm out of shape. 
Well, if any of those symptoms occur, and some of those other symptoms, shortness of breath, fatigue, sweating at low levels of activity, could be signs of a heart problem. And those, what we call atypical signs, are more common in women than men. Okay, yes, women can have a severe crushing chest pain. Feels like an elephant's on your chest. We can see that in men and women. But in women, we commonly see dizziness, lightheadedness, sweating, exercise intolerance. So any of those symptoms, you need to write that down in your little logbook and make an appointment to see your physician and discuss that in the near future after you have your symptoms. And the other point is that cardiovascular disease is largely preventable. When we diagnose and treat your blood pressure, your diabetes, most importantly, when you stop smoking, your risk for heart disease will go down by 50%, okay, within one year. So this is not an irreversible problem. This is not an irreversible problem. We can treat these conditions and decrease your risk for a subsequent serious event. This is an important slide because it just summarizes the point that we're discussing and it also, it also emphasizes what we are doing here at St. Genevieve County Memorial Hospital to help work with you. This discusses that heart disease and stroke and cancer, lung cancer and breast cancer, are far and away the most <coughs> common causes of death in the United States for women. These are programs that we emphasize here. Okay, we obviously have a excellent, superb Women's Health Department and Dr. Cavins and Mary Priscilla are going to discuss this in the next lecture. Dr. Liss and his wonderful team has been here for years and years. Who has is one of is a, a national and world-renowned oncologist, and we have the honor and privilege of having him work with us here on, on a daily basis. And we have a good cardiovascular team, and I was recruited specifically by the hospital to help uh, work with you all, the community, and the physicians on strengthening cardiovascular care. I'm here every day. I'm not here once a week or once a month. I'm here, I live here, I am part of the community, and my job here is to work with you as your general manager and coach to help work with you and your medical team on defining what is your risk and intervening and, and, and making you feel stronger, generally including uh, doing testing. Move this along here. Okay, we talked about the signs and symptoms. This is just to show that a blockage, doesn't matter if it's in your leg, your heart, or your brain, it can occur. And when we have blockages in any of the blood vessels of the body, we need to evaluate the heart to make sure there's not a heart condition. Are you at risk? These are risk factors that what we would call two groups, modifiable risk factors, by diagnosing and treating these conditions of high cholesterol, blood pressure, activity, poor activity, obesity and overweight, diabetes and smoking, we will absolutely decrease your risk for heart attack and death from a cardiovascular problem by over 50%. Certain things we can't change. We can't change your age, we can't change your family history, we can't change your race, okay? However, if we focus on these modifiable factors, we can definitely make you feel better and live longer. Let's talk about some of these uh, in detail. Cholesterol. Your cholesterol needs to be checked for the few of us in the room who are over the age of 50, okay, every year, okay? If it's elevated, okay, it needs to be rechecked and treatment, including pharmacologic treatment, drugs, but most importantly, lifestyle measures need to be instituted to help you become educated and also help treat you with exercise, lifestyle measures, and likely medication therapy. We have to take your blood pressure. I mentioned this earlier. I'm a certified hypertension specialist. Um, I am the only physician within 50 miles of this institution who specializes in hypertension. This is what I do. And by diagnosing and treating you effectively with drugs that we know will not only bring the numbers down, but help you live longer, 
We can make you feel better, and we can make you live longer. <coughs> so measuring your blood pressure at all medical uh, interactions, when you go into your uh, gynecologist for your yearly exam, when you go to your dentist, your eye doctor, they're all recommended to check your blood pressure. And the number we, we, we are concerned about is 140 over 90. If it's persistently over 140 over 90, you need to be seen by your primary care doctor for treatment, which will include lifestyle measures as well as drug therapy. What we see in this slide, and I try not to put a lot of medical slides in here, but this is very important. This slide looks at the, you know that blood pressure is the top number and the bottom number. The number we worry about is the top number. For all of us in the room, except our two little friends and helpers on the side who are young, worry about the top number, forget the bottom number. Because the top number tells you your risk. And if your top number is over 140 on two successive readings, you're at higher risk. But this is really important. When you bring your blood pressure down by just five millimeters, so let's say it was 150, and you uh, start on a walking program, or you start a medication, and it goes down from 150 to 145, your risk for a heart event goes down by 25% just by that little drop in blood pressure. So any intervention we do will improve your risk for a heart attack and stroke, primarily stroke. So please have your blood pressure measured, discuss with your physicians and your medical providers what can be done to get your blood pressure down to our target goal. Exercise, obesity, watching calories. Okay, I have a couple numbers here, but this is in the handout. I'm gonna skip the details, except for my good friend, water, okay? Now we're back to our water thing here again. Why is water so important? Water is important because it flushes toxins out of your system. Water is important because it keeps your body well hydrated. You don't get sick, dizzy, especially in hot weather. So you need to drink between six and eight glasses of, of water a day in addition to the consumption of your other liquids. Okay, unless you have a, a medical condition where they have to restrict your fluid restriction. And those are few and far between. Kidney problems, heart failure, those are specific situations. So we say six to eight, and in young people, maybe up to 12 eight ounce glasses of water a day. The other key feature on your general nutrition is don't skip meals, okay? And you wanna eat on a regular <coughs> basis. Breakfast is called breakfast for a reason. It breaks the fast of the night before. That's what the word means. And if you skip breakfast thinking you're gonna save calories, what happens is at lunch, your body absorbs more of what you eat. And this, is, this was a 10-year, that one sentence was a 10-year focus of my career when I was at Washington University in St. Louis. We were able to define for the first time and develop a test to measure how much cholesterol people absorb. And we were lucky enough to get a patent for that. Okay, so we can measure, we can say you absorb 20%, 80%, 90% of the cholesterol that you eat and ingest. But one thing we found with the, all the studies we published was that when you skip meals, you may absorb 50% when you eat breakfast, but if you don't eat breakfast for a week and you only eat lunch and your evening meal, you can absorb up to 70 to 80% of your calories. So you're not saving anything. So you need to eat on a regular basis. Okay, and just as it's important to eat breakfast, it's also important to eat your evening meal within three to four hours before going to bed. Okay, you don't wanna just eat and then just go to bed. Okay, because you want some time for your body to work on those calories. So that's why the European and the South American concept of the larger meal in the middle of the day is really a great concept. So having your major meal at noon or 2 p.m then having a snack in the afternoon and a lighter meal in the evening it is a, a very good suggestion and commonly employed by a lot of people. This is a suggestion of what we call the Mediterranean diet and it's in your handout, um, which is getting back to more um, basic foods of, of nuts, protein, staying away from sweets <coughs> and sugars. This is, the, this is right out of the handout I gave you. One of the handouts is called the DASH diet, 
which is this handout. And it has excruciating detail and examples on the back of, of specific dietary interventions, which are important for uh, people with high blood pressure. And label reading. Let me spend two or three minutes on portion size <coughs> and label reading. Okay. Now, for some of you in the audience that may be a diabetic, you all know about what's called <coughs> carbohydrate counting. Okay, one carbohydrate, two carbohydrates. Everyone has heard that. But does anybody know where that came from? Does anybody know what, what is a unit of carbohydrates? This is where it came from. In 1955, but it was published in 1961, the National Institutes of Health put out a general nutrition survey to the community because it, it saw from a practical point of view, looking at data from Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, that people who um, are overweight, specifically people who have diabetes and overweight, have a greater risk of dying. So that's, that's when they started looking at what dietary features can they do. So who picked up the grant and who defined it? Kellogg's of Battle Creek. Now everyone looks at me like I'm crazy. But this is true. In 1961, this box of breakfast cereal was defined as one unit of carbohydrates. Sounds simple. So then they went back and they measured it, and now they've done you know, all kinds of equivalents and this and that. But your good old Kellogg's Corn Flakes with Mr. Rooster on the front was the definition of a portion of carbohydrates. Now. The thing that's important to remember is that portion size varies. For example, this is a box from 1961. This is a box I got out of the cafeteria at Missouri Baptist a couple weeks ago. This is a current portion box of carbohydrates. Guess what? This unit in 1961 was 23 grams. That's how much is in there, which is what a unit of carbohydrates is. This box is 21 grams. So even a box of cornflakes now is not the same as it used to be. So label reading is very important. So that's why I have um, in part of your handout on label reading. And in, on your nutritional labels, you'll see discussion of fats, sugars, and other nutrients. So you need to learn how to read labels. And our dietitians and our home nurses are wonderful at talking with you. And I have other handouts if you like specifically on labor reading. Now let me give you let me give you an example. Okay, who can't talk about their children? I cannot stop talking about my children. God love them. This is my younger one. Okay, I'm honored that he's a third year at the Air Force Academy and he's the hockey on their goalie team. And he's a goalie on their hockey team. Okay? Now, as an athlete he eats four to 5,000 calories a day. He has 7% body fat, measured by uh, lots of different ways. So, obviously, everybody's situation is different. Athletes, older people, younger people, males, females, it's all related to their individual case. So everybody's situation is different. So my David can eat 4,000 calories a day and not gain an ounce. If you or I ate 4,000 calories a day, we'd be sleeping for a month. <laughs> Unfortunately, he's out for the rest of the season. And to show how much I love you, he had surgery on his hand yesterday for a tendon rupture. And God love him, my other one, my older one, seen here. This is uh, their, his first day of kindergarten. He was two is at our back porch in Chesterfield. God love him, my, my older one, who is in the Broadway world in New York, flew out to Colorado Springs to be with him and, and be with him because his, his mom and I, uh, his mom uh, couldn't uh, go and, and I was here because I was asked to be with you. Okay, and he did just great with surgery. Okay, so God love him, I have wonderful children and they're all different and we all love our kids. But the point of this is everybody's metabolism is different. A couple of points on reading labels. This is 
the biggest dramatic difference. So you go to the store, you buy something called low-fat granola. Sounds good, healthy, granola's good for you. Okay, let's look at the label. What does this label say here? Let's just look at sugars. It has 18 grams of sugar in this box. Okay? Our little cornflakes friend has two grams of sugar. There's nine times as much sugar, even though it's low fat. Low fat Fig Newton cookies have more calories than regular Fig Newtons. Okay, now that was a trick they did because they changed, and then when they when it became obvious, what they did was they changed the size. You know, what the, I don't even know who made the bisco, I guess, makes Fig Newtons. What they did is they cut the size. The size of a, of a low fat Fig Newton now is different than it was five years ago when it came out, so the calories match because they made it up with other fillers. Okay, so you have to read labels. Reading labels is very important. And some things you'll be surprised about. Um, oatmeal, is, it's pretty obvious, has very, very low sugar. Oatmeal is a wonderful source of fiber. Now, even our frosted, our frosted flakes, okay, you know, have um, 10 grams of sugar, but it's still less than the low-fat granola. So reading labels is very, very important. So I have examples here that you could be happy to look at. Okay, as a general rule, portion size for fruits and vegetables is a half a cup. That's a portion size of rice, vegetable, fruit, pasta, as a general rule, that's the size. The next general rule for meat and protein is four ounces, which is the size of a deck of cards or it'll fit into the palm of your hand. That's a portion of meat or chicken. So what do we have here? We have a hamburger patty, okay? Okay, fits into the palm of your hand. I have a steak here somewhere from our friends at Overly. A little bit bigger, because Overly has a little bit bigger steak, but not too bad. Okay, so you can get a four to five ounce steak from Mr. Overly down the street. Chicken, okay? Chicken breast. See, recurrent theme here, okay? So, the point is that that's what, that's what we like to do, is about the size of your hand. And let's do a couple more points, and I have one other thing. Fish. It's very important exercise on a regular basis. You want to walk 100 to 150 minutes a week, getting your blood sugar under control, and not smoking. Cutting back on smoking.